So uh, Mike asked me, Mike Lombardo asked me to come here today to address a couple of key questions uh, that we've all been pondering. One is, can we expand the effectiveness of our school-based continuum if we bring a broader voice, including our community mental health providers and other community partners to the table, and if we bring youth and family voice to the behavior, to the table. And the, another question is, how can we enhance the continuum with a greater array of evidence-based practices to meet the needs of more students with greater effectiveness? But you know, I know you're having lunch, so on a scale of one to 10, one to five, how's your lunch? Five being really good, let's see. One being, I wish I was at Burger King. <laughs> All right, Rob, I think that was a 3.86. I learned that from Rob, okay. So, you know, I know you're also thinking about, you know, you've got the afternoon, so you're thinking about that, and can you get enough protein? Can you get enough carbs? Can you get enough caffeine? Bigger question always for women at conference, education conferences or concerts, is will I be able to get into the bathroom, right? In, in time to get to my next session. So I know all that stuff is on your mind. And if you can take a few minutes and think about kids with mental health needs, so sticking with the food theme, uh, our food for thought this afternoon, uh, jumping off of Rob's very, very strong reminders about systemic features this morning. You know, why, why do schools need to be more systemic? about addressing the mental health needs of schools and how can multi-tiered systems of support help us improve our capacity to prevent and intervene with a broader range of kids with mental health needs. For example, kids with internalizing disorders who might not pop up in office discipline referrals. And I'm also going to provide for you some examples of this work going on around the country uh, in terms of preventing and intervening, intervening with a broader range of kids with mental health needs. So to try to give you one more thing to do besides eat, think, and listen, I'm going to try to give you a little advanced organizers for all the teachers in the room. So I know there's a range of people from clinicians who are getting CEUs, administrators, coaches, trainers. How many classroom teachers do we have here today? All right. Okay. So when we're talking about mental health, we're talking about everybody, in particular classroom teachers. So I would just encourage you to think a little advanced organizer. Look for a big idea you could get and maybe share with others when you leave here. Or a big idea that, hmm, what was she really talking about? Or do I really agree with that? Or do I really understand that? Something you're still circling the wagons on. But I hope that everybody, even though it's lunchtime and you're getting a lot of information, I hope that you can at least find one idea that you can take back, whether you're a principal, a trainer, a coach, a clinician, and of course a classroom teacher. So that's kind of my attempt at differentiated instruction. One of, one of the big messages here, of course, is that schools cannot do mental health, support the mental health needs of kids all by themselves. We need partners. And some of the startling data that you may be familiar with, and as Rob said, all these slides are available to you. When we started uh, putting together the interconnected system framework uh, seven or eight years ago, one of the questions that we had was, you know, how many kids are there? And we keep sharing this information, and if you think about it, think if you have, you know, 20 kids in your classroom, one in five, I'm not great at math, but you know, that, that's four kids in every classroom, right? Okay? And the, the news that isn't new is most kids who have mental health needs don't get any treatment. And the scarier part is school is actually the de facto mental health treatment place. And, you know, we're not always doing that great of a job historically. So that's a little scary to me. But we know the real sad fact is the juvenile justice system is the major default system for kids with mental health needs. And I think the mainstream media is now making it really clear to people that we do have a suicide crisis among young adults in this country. And we know that the factors that impact mental health don't just happen during the school day and they don't just happen in the community and educators have to be aware of factors that occur outside of school. I know you all know that. And we can't just hand kids off to community providers. That's not doing it either, right? 
I don't know if any of you saw, but talk about mainstream media, September 7th, NPR put up a, a brief online article called The Silent Epidemic, the Mental Health Crisis in Our Schools. And by the way, that's why I changed on the last slide from, I used to have 70%. NPR says 80, I changed it to 80, okay? But, you know, this mainstream message that they put up, and they've also had one follow-up that came out, I think, yesterday. Uh, but you can find this, just Google it, Silent Epidemic, NPR, September 7th. But their conclusion was really important. And it says that in schools, mental health should be everybody's job. Now, we know that possibly freaks out a lot of people, uh, especially classroom teachers. But we, we really need to talk about this, and we really need to face this challenge head on. We do have a history of confusion about what an effective mental health intervention is. We have think, we used to think that if we put somebody in a certain classroom and the people in that classroom had certain credentials, whew, our job's done, right? Or uh, once we would label somebody and get them diagnosed, get them eligible for something, there was an assumption that effective interventions would just follow, and that is not the case. The interventions we've done in school for kids with mental health interventions unfortunately haven't been so great, we haven't focused on fidelity, and we don't always have resources allocated in the right way to be commensurate with level of need. So we, we have a lot of work to do, but we've made a lot of progress. Uh, Rob, this is triangle number one, I have three, and if you count a pyramid, that would make four, okay? All right, so this is my favorite triangle because it shows all the green by itself. And what we know is no matter the level of mental health need of a child, they should experience success with the natural curriculum every day, even though they might need an add-on in order to do that and they might need even individualized support in order to do that. The fact remains that we want to make sure that they are experiencing the core curriculum, whether it's the school-wide reinforcement system or success with the reading program. And our job is to layer on in order to make that happen. Our focus on the kids, on the teachers and the other staff, and of course the parents and the families. And we know that PBIS has, has a solid foundation. There's 800 of you who came to this conference because you're, you're very aware of the fact, oh, 808, sorry. You're very aware of the fact that the, the advantages that are up here on the screen now are what we're all after. So we know that PBIS provides a very, very solid foundation to help improve the quality of life of all kids. But we also know that the solid foundation, you, you gotta have more than a foundation in your house, right? And more is needed. For example, is anybody struggling with tier two, tier three out there? Or you guys got that nailed in California? Or, you know, we, we know there's a lot of struggles with that. We also, as I mentioned, our kids with internalizing needs are also uh, kids that are perhaps not benefiting in the way that they should. And we also know that there's a lot of data and information about the environment in the community and in the family that the families have that influences whether or not we're able to be successful in school. So how do we expand and move forward? Uh, we came up with the term interconnected. It's a mouthful, and I almost was going to run a contest to get a better name for it. But when we talked about interconnecting the systems, our colleagues from the Center for School Mental Health uh, talked about we have a lot of people in schools called mental health providers. Some of them are employed by schools, some of them are not. But they're not really integrated, and sometimes they're only seen as the tier three people. And sometimes they're only seen as the special education people. And part of the discussion of interconnected and the keyword systems is how do we change the systems so more effective practices are happening for more people. More importantly, the litmus test for me always is do the teachers feel confident and competent with the array of challenges that kids walk in the door with? Can we make mental health less transparent and more understandable and uh, more supportive for teachers as well? So a bunch of us got together, and with Rob's blessing and George's blessing, we started working on a monograph that we put out that actually seems old right now, but it's only been published online since I think 
2013. So, but the work went on before that. And some of the information I'm going to share with you now and advertisement from the breakout session that follows actually comes from the interconnected system framework uh, monograph, but there's a lot more that's been happening since 2013. A lot of learning is going on, and I'm going to try to share some of that with you. So let's start. If I, if I knew how to do video, I'd be playing California Dreaming right now, but just hum a, <clears throat> hum a few bars to yourself. But, you know, a little California context. And California has been a proponent of system of care. Matter of fact, the first time I ever came to California to do work was before I knew about school-wide systems of positive behavior support, working with system of care and mental health. And people in California, you need to be proud of your history of system of care. And I brought these slides from Mike, so they, of course, represent that county. But, you know, you've got laws. You've got laws about people working together. That's impressive. I'm from Illinois. We don't have laws that say you have to work together. You, you, you also have the right people at the table in California. Look at all those players. You have the right people at the table, right? And you also have consistent implementation, and you have linkages, and you have... Uh, state all the way down to the community level, there's a defined system. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I'm saying this is a context. What I don't have up here, I should have a big money sign. Your state puts money behind children's mental health. And one of the things we want to help you, you do is become able to make it reach more kids more effectively. Also in California, with your system of care, you, you know, the good news is you also have a sense of humor, okay? So this is important. This word collaboration has been thrown around for years. Um, my first learning of how hard collaboration was, I learned from Carl Dennis in Chicago, who was one of the wraparound system of care leaders. We call him, some people call him the grandfather of wraparound. We're from Chicago. We call him the godfather of wraparound. But... Carl Dennis stood up at a podium the first time I heard him speak, and he said, collaboration is basically an unnatural act between unconsenting adults. <laughs> and his point was that people think they're collaborating when they're actually not. So, Mike, I appreciate the slide of, you know, it's not telling other people what to do. It's coming to the table to decide what to do together. And that's a very difficult process. So oh, the interconnected system framework is an attempt at moving closer to the how versus the why and the what. So let's, let's kind of go there for a minute and see. So what is the interconnected system framework? How do we define it? Well, of course, we define it as a structure and a process. There isn't one model because not only is every state different, but even within states, especially, for example, like Illinois, County systems are not as equally defined as they are in places like California and Florida. And even within communities, there's different structures. So we're, we're talking about a structure and a process for people to interact in the most effective and in the most efficient way that they can together. So another key feature here is you have to have, as Rob mentioned this morning, leadership people in charge. We cannot just tell the clinicians in the schools and the clinicians in the community, work together and figure it out. Because there's all kinds of policy structures, job descriptions, funding issues that get in the way. So the critical component here for interconnected system framework is key stakeholders who actually can say, we're not going to do it that way anymore, and we're going to change what the funding is. We're going to change what the job descriptions are. People who actually have the authority to do that, instead, again, of dropping it down to the practitioners to figure it out. So we work with what we call district community leadership teams that actually resemble a lot of system of care structures. Now, when you look at the core features up here, they should look familiar to you, and this is what we're talking about when we say use the MTSS foundation, right? We're talking about mental health not being a tier three special ed thing, but being a part of a prevention-based system. Uh, we're talking about teams, but in this case, we're talking about bringing new people onto the teams at the district level and inside the building. And that's not always easy. And we're talking about database decision-making. That's pretty popular. Everybody wants to do that, right? 
But one of the things that's been missing from special education and mental health is a formal selection process for teams to actually decide what interventions to do. The history is we hand a kid to a person who has certain initials after their name and we assume they'll figure out what to do with that kid. And that creates often siloed approaches inside schools with a lack of transparency and a lack of knowledge on the part of the teachers about what's really happening when that kid is, quote, seeing somebody. We use a lot of air quotes around that. The other issue that's been missing is we have not begun yet progress monitoring mental health type interventions for kids with internalizing disorders or interventions delivered by clinicians, for example, uh, with the same intensity of progress monitoring and the same intensity of fidelity measurement, although things have improved drastically around evidence-based practices in the mental health field in the past 10 years. It's been an unbelievable shift in the mental health world towards accountability. Uh, Rob mentioned the importance of coaching and making sure if people are delivering interventions that they're actually doing it accurately and they have the confidence to know that they're doing it right. And there's a lot of dialogue around screening and what should we screen for, Who, what, what groups of kids at what age should we start screening for depression, for example, which is a new discussion in schools recently. So what does it really mean to integrate? Well, the first thing is people have to expect that the routines and the procedures are going to change. So people who used to come into a school and, quote, see kids are now parts of teams helping decide what interventions either they or somebody else will deliver. As opposed to the handoff, we want to have the clinicians, the community providers, and we want family and youth voice sticking with our system of care principles to actually be at the table. This requires or leads to a change in how interventions are selected and monitored and how clinicians work together, whether they're employed by the school or an agency, to look at a presenting problem of a group of kids and actually choose an intervention that matches the presenting problem data. That's not rocket science, but it doesn't happen all the time, right? So th this has a, been a big change. Change in the language we use. Uh, there's, I'm a big language freak. I, 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 I don't know, I can't help it. Certain words get under my skin. Right now what's under my skin is saying the kids getting mental health services or the kids in counseling or the kids in therapy. Those are generic categories in which there could be a multitude of different evidence-based practices and we want down to the teacher level, the paraprofessional level, to know what the intervention is and to have confidence that they will know how to support that intervention back in the classroom. So this is part of the explicitness of accountability as well as the transparency. Now, of course, this changes roles and function to the point where we run conference sessions next week, San Diego, anybody going to be at the Center for School Mental Health Conference? We have a session on the changing role of clinicians and multi-tiered systems of support. We've been running those sessions, those networking groups for seven or eight years now, and that discussion is uh, getting easier and we're getting more clear about it. One of the ways we like to explain the interconnected system framework is to talk about what's different What's traditional? What could be different? So I think I've covered a few of them, but up on the screen and in our materials and things online, you'll see a lot of this traditional preferred, uh, we're always arguing about what to call it, old, new, nobody wants to feel like they're still old, but nonetheless. Today I'm using traditional. You know, where a mental health counselor is there to see kids versus a mental health person being on the teams. Where people think only certain people do mental health, when in essence, the, the mental health clinicians are the social-emotional leaders in the building and help other people become more comfortable, more competent, and more confident with supporting a range of interventions. And the issue of, uh, do, you ever, do you ever go to a meeting where somebody said to the clinician, so how's George doing in that group? The answer, pretty good. I think he likes it. Okay, let's keep him in it. There's kids who've been in the same group for 10 years, right? So there's, there's some work to be done in terms of accountability in that regard. Uh, over the past year or two, we've been trying to boil down some clear key messages 
around this, and I'm going to go through a couple of them. We'll go through them more in depth for those who are, you, are the real, uh, have a stronger interest in this in the breakout system. But single system of delivery, access is not enough, mental health is for all, and multi-tiered system of support are essential for effective installation. So on the single system of delivery, our, our colleague Mark Weiss, the former founding director of the Center for School Mental Health, he actually wrote this one for us recently. And, you know, under the typical approach, school by school, it's different, the relationship with community providers and mental health providers. What's, what's different here is that the uh, uh, district works out a plan. Well, let me go through all the typical. The next typical is a community mental health provider, for example, is co-located in a building but more in a handoff mode and more in a separate mode. And that the professional development, evaluation, and family involvement are different on the mental health side than on the school side, even when the mental health providers are actually there in the building. So we call that more of a siloed approach. What we're looking to do is have a district set partnerships with community agencies. And then the buildings have people on the team sanctioned by the districts and the agencies who flexed up the job descriptions, et cetera, and that they serve on teams, look at data, select intervention, and cross-training. So for example, trauma-informed interventions. It's becoming more prevalent that everybody's being trained in those, not just the clinicians. And then we have to use the tiers. What does trauma-informed mean at tier one versus tier three? So that's what we mean by single system of delivery. Access is not enough. I've already mentioned to you the importance of that in terms of uh, we don't want to count referrals. We want it to know which interventions are working which, with which presenting problems. And we want people to be explicit. You know, so for example, the kids in mental health services versus the students receiving four coping, uh, coping skills group sessions. Now the teacher knows exactly what the skill is that they're learning in the group. And we want to, if you're using a tiered approach, you have a much better chance to tackle the issue we call transference and generalization. Who knows what that means? Anybody know what transference and generalization? Sure you do. And if you don't, what it means is if you're in a group instructional setting, how do we know when you go back to your natural setting that you're actually going to use the skills when you feel anxiety? So if you demonstrate coping skills under the direction of a clinician in a small group, that's fantastic, but that's not even half the battle, is it? Right? So we know that access is not enough and we need to make sure kids are actually able to use the new skills that they're learning. Uh, mental health is for all and as I mentioned earlier, this is about having our uh, community partners help us with our tier one, our tier two and not just our tier three and so that we can build, as Rob said this morning, more consistent, predictable, positive, and safe environments in school, even if you are a kid who suffers from anxiety or depression or a conduct disorder or attention deficit disorder. We want everybody to be able to get support. And I, Rob, I loved your story this morning about Lewis, you know. We, we, in the old days, Lewis wouldn't have been successful unless people zeroed in, pulled him out, etc. So that was a wonderful story this morning about mental health is for all. And of course the fourth message is just a reiteration of the features that we've already discussed in terms of teams, data, a continuum of linked evidence-based practices, I'll talk more about that in a minute, screening, progress monitoring, and the ongoing professional development and coaching. Couple thoughts about multi-tiered systems. Again, we want to install foundational interventions school-wide first, but you know what, folks? It's looking a lot different than just three to five expectations. That's just the basic building blocks. We have communities where we're installing lessons around respect, responsibility, and safety that are teaching kids replacement behaviors for behaviors that are associated with kids who've experienced a lot of trauma, for example. So our foundations in our tier one are looking a little different in different communities depending on the demographic data. And of course, the, the monitoring and progress 
monitoring. Some examples of additional interventions that we're seeing come into a continuum, for example, trauma-informed interventions, interventions specific for anxiety, and more uh, building bridges and connections between kids and mentors and people who will help them with life goals, right? So in our multi-tiered system of support, linking the evidence-based practices is not the job of one person. It's the job of the teams, and the teams have to make sure that's happening. I'm hoping clinicians in the room are feeling a little bit of light or relief, right? Because the expectation that if you hand the kid to the clinician and they're supposed to figure it out, when you're not calling them to fix a fire here and a fire there, right? So having people be part of a system is important and linking across uh, tiers is important. Now the good news is, and this is for all the teachers, you ready? This might be your big idea, this might be your takeaway, okay? The good news is there's no mystery to what is involved with an evidence-based mental health intervention. The second part of the good news related to the first, it's, it's connected to what you already know how to do. Whether a kid has an attention deficit disorder, anxiety, depression, aggression, acting out behavior, they always have to learn new ways to cope and function. It comes down to learning new behaviors. Aren't you relieved? Don't you feel better? Start your dessert now, okay? The anxiety part is over, right, okay? So what we already know how to do is actually what clinicians do when they have kids in groups. Now they add techniques like, for example, mindfulness. I heard, I heard in the news this morning there's a mindfulness conference in Sacramento next week. Anybody see that? Okay, mindfulness is a technique that came out of, you know, uh, psychotherapeutic techniques where if kids have experienced a lot of pain and trauma, before you practice the replacement behaviors, you got to make sure they're with you, right? And that they're able to focus. And now they're teaching mindfulness to teachers to use in the classroom to make sure kids are grounded in our learning. You know, the transparency is already happening. So teaching and instruction are the basis of evidence-based practices for mental health across the fields. Now, one of the questions that comes up in multi-tiered systems of support is where do specific mental health interventions fit? And the answer is that depends on the data of the school and the data of the community. So for example, if you're in a neighborhood on the southwest side of Chicago, where the child welfare contact numbers would make your hair stand on end, they're so high, right? The violence rates, the number of kids who know somebody in their family or neighborhood who's been incarcerated. How about um, communities near uh, military bases when deployment happens, homeless, homelessness, unemployment sparks, spikes. These are data points that tier one teams and district teams need to be mindful of. And if we have different people at the table who are connected to the community, they can bring that data in and we can do things differently. Uh, so we're talking about multi-tiered systems of support with some strength here with some differences, with some different people at the table. Now, in order to establish a structure for this integrated work, I'm going to just give you some examples of that. So, for example, one thing we always have found ourselves dialoguing about with people who are working on this is to remember that more is not necessarily better. And, you know, we learned that from Robin George back in the day, right? And it's still an important lesson here. And we also know that we have to have formal routines, procedures, and processes embedded in the teams. But now we have different people at the t team level and maybe different data to look at. And of course, as Rob talked to us about this morning, the idea of building local capacity. And right now, I'm talking about the classroom teachers. We're talking about all those people who raised their hand in here, right? We want to make sure that they are feeling competent and confident with what sorts of uh, approaches and dialogue they use with kids who have different issues. So here's an example of, it, in order to move together, the community players, the families, and the school district, or districts if it's a combined approach, need to get together and make sure they're on the same page. This is from our uh, second largest school district in Illinois. Quick, what's the largest school district in Illinois? Uh, 
All right, at least I know you're awake, some of you, correct, okay. There's, or as we say in Illinois, there's Illinois and then there's Chicago, right? But this is uh, Unified School District 46, our second largest district. Now, it took them 18 months to come up with an MOU that all the different providers and everybody would agree to. And it, but the first thing they did was come up with the shared mission. I always get a kick out of the fact that they underline the data one. I've never taken that out of the slide when they gave it to me. Uh, you could tell who took the notes. It was the PBIS coach from the district, okay? All right, so, and look at all the different players seven or eight years ago this started that they still have at the table. This is not just formal county mental health agencies. We don't have great ones in Illinois. They're all dispersed and different and whatever. But nonetheless, this is what I call mom and pop shop stuff, you guys. People in the community, there, in, in certain neighborhoods in Chicago, there's little groups who have a little tiny grant and they're focused on one aspect of support to families. So this is a pretty broad group. And uh, I did a presentation, talk about building local capacity, with the U46 at a children's mental health conference last year. And the PBIS coach and her mental health partner stood up there. I introduced them and did the ISF. And they showed where their school and community had moved to over seven or eight years from that mission statement. And you know, it is now a routine to have community providers. Are they perfect? No. Are they making huge progress? Yes. Are they getting more interventions in place than maybe they would have before? Absolutely. One of the other steps besides getting a shared mission is using your PBIS, MTSS, whatever you call it, skills in terms of how you organize data and work with people. There's a lot of resource mapping, we call it, examining the current conditions, and then creating an integrated plan for priority. So I'm sure you all can read this plan from Scranton, Pennsylvania up here. Okay, I know you can't. It's got routine stuff on it, like blah, blah schools, we'll do tier one this year, we'll install check-in, check-out in three schools. But let me pull out a couple of the things that are in there that show that they have an integrated plan. That's the name of a local mental health center whose clinicians will continue participating on the tier two systems team. That's right in there under who's gonna get trained in check and check out, right? Okay? School social workers and the community mental health staff will co-facilitate. They're calling them social skills groups. Now, if the only the mental health person was doing it, they would call them group. Right? When teachers talk about them, we call them social skills groups, right? Language, I know, I'm a nut with the language. Okay, so the team approach is extremely critical in this regard, right? And again, what tier depends on your data. And I wanted to share with you an example from the great Midwestern state of Wisconsin. And our Wisconsin PBIS network is supported from the state level in a combined approach with their school mental health approach. And they've adopted trauma-sensitive schools curriculum. And interestingly enough, they're only installing it first in schools that have tier one fidelity at PBIS. So they have a combined approach from the top. And they have their triangle. I think this is number two, Rob. This is the Wisconsin Triangle showing their trauma-informed care, right? And one of the things we're working on with them right now is how do you monitor the impact of a trauma-informed, and my example is going to be a tier two group, and how do you connect it back to tier one? Because we feel closely that a key feature of multi-tiered system, it's not simply Everybody gets some stuff, some kids get some stuff, and a few get some stuff. There's a connection. It's like reading. Whether you're in a tier two reading group or a tier three intervention, what are you working on? Word recognition, comprehension, right? So we want to try to create that same transparency. How many of you are familiar with check in, check out? Whoa, look at that. Whoa, should have taken a picture of that. Awesome. So you know what a DPR is? We can talk secret language, okay? Daily progress report. Now, one of the things we think is very important is when a child goes into a tier two skill group, that it connect back to the three to five expectations for transference and generalization so that the teachers know how to prompt, pre-correct, and reinforce the skill the kid's getting in the group. But we don't want the teachers to have yellow sticky notes all over about which kid's in which group. 
So we came up with this years ago with our tier two, tier three demo project when we were struggling with this, and now we're applying it to trauma-informed, where the kids on check-in, check-out, and the kid, now they're in a trauma-informed tier two group in this example, we actually put the skill taught in the group on the check-in, check-out card so the teachers know that they can zero in and say the same words, right? Transference and generalization. Now, does that mean every kid in a tier two group should be in check-in, check-out? I have an opinion, which is probably more based on opinion than fact, and I think yes. I think absolutely yes, because that's how you transition them off, and that's how you make a seamless progress monitoring system for the teachers. Here's a tier three example. So this kid now might have a, a, either a functional uh, uh, behavior plan and or some other skill plan with an individualized person working on it, and you can actually link that back to the instruction in the classroom. So we really encourage you to think about linkage with the tiers. Okay, this, should we count this as a triangle? Who thinks this count? Oh, all right, thank you, thank you, okay. So this pyramid came from a middle school in New Hampshire that's working on the interconnected system framework. And I, I put coping cat in red, I hope you can see it. That's what they added to their continuum of other supports and services. How did they get there? They had a team. They had a mental health clinician, they had a school psychologist, they had a bunch of kids who weren't doing well with the current interventions. They looked at the data of this group of 15 kids. And, then, and by the way, this, this slide is from one of our ISF webinars where the New Hampshire people presented this. So I didn't change their information on here, right? Okay. School psychologists researched small group interventions for these students, found Coping Cat. Anybody ever heard of Coping Cat? It's not a panacea, but it's an excellent evidence-based practice that teaches kids replacement behaviors for their anxiety and non-coping behaviors. You know, kids who run away, put their head down, go to the nurse every five minutes. You, you guys know what we're talking about, right? And so they, they researched it. What I love about this is they had dosage, they had frequency, and they had data. And then they installed the interventions. What did Rob tell us this morning? Systems first, practices second. Got it, right? And here's their description of it. They have a measure. I think it's a horrible name for a measure that measures anxiety because it's called scared. I don't know if somebody did that on purpose or not. But nonetheless, they, they chose that because they felt it fit with the presenting problem data. They looked at kids pre and post coping cat, their tier two team did. They looked at absences because that was one of their presenting problems. They looked at visits to the nurse because with these 15 kids, that was one of the presenting problems, right? Now, those of you that come to session this afternoon, we actually have a tool in the monograph that can help you go through a selection process for evidence-based practices. Uh, another tool that we have that's not in the monograph, and we're still working with it with school districts around the country, is we call it the ISF Action Planning Companion Guide to the School-Wide PBIS Tiered Fidelity Inventory. Oh my God, that's horrible, isn't it? That's a long name. But you get the idea. I know you're familiar with the Tiered Fidelity Inventory. What, more people in California than in any other state did it? I saw those numbers this morning. I was like, whoa, I'm glad I'm sharing this tool. Basically, this is not a tool to be scored. This is a tool to guide your planning. And so we took every item on the TFI and came up with an ISF, an Interconnected System Framework Enhancement. And then you can create action plans out of it. Hear me again, this does not affect the score of your TFI. It's called the Action Planning Companion Guide, all right? We're not at the point yet where we have scoring anchors for these things. So this is not part of your TFI score. Am I clean, Anne? Am I okay? All right. All right, so for example, behavioral expectations. We recommend you have families, students, and community providers. And here's what happened with the school. My colleague and partner in this work, Susan Barrett, learned from a school uh, in the, in the mid-Atlantic states. The kids and the families looked at the expectations and they said, well, what are the teachers supposed to do? So they added something called guide me. 
and it explains what the teachers are supposed to do relative to respect, responsibility, and safety. Why did that come about? Because they had youth voice and family voice on the team. Things change based on who's on the table. Some of the family members on the district team said families could benefit from having matrices and ways to teach positive behavior at home, so they came up with them for them. We have one community outside of Chicago, uh, very close in suburban town, where the police department, the park district, and my favorite is the lady from the library, the, li the library lady, she, you should hear her talk about reductions in behavior incidents in the library after school. It, it's heartwarming, okay? But the whole town, shares the expectations. It's not just for the school. So we, we thought that was a fun one to share. When we're talking about defining problem behavior, a key item on the TFI, this is one I hope you can take back with you. This is the easiest one to take back. You're, those of you on school teams, you ready? This is your one, okay? What you need to do is change your data collection procedure, and Susan Barrett recommends we call it the time out of class form rather than the office discipline referral form. And she says and taught us that what that says down there is kids who went to see the nurse or asked to go to see a counselor. Do you know kids like that? Teachers, do you know kids who avoid and leave in a manner that's not documented, right? We say any time a kid leaves the instructional environment is data. So look for your kids who create time out of class even if they don't have disruptive behavior. Another, of course, is looking at the community data. I mentioned that before. And here's some examples of school-based data. And here's some examples we've seen from communities, uh, from district and community leadership teams based on the fact that they're looking more deeply. Uh, an example I can tell you about that I remember hearing from somebody in one of our webinars is there was a spike in suicide ideation, hospitalizations, and suicide attempts in the community. And at the high school, they had a dialogue about that data, and they started talking about what are we teaching all kids, and where do we need to beef up our health curriculum, or when are we going to do it? We have a crisis in our community. It should be tier one. And if you didn't have people who brought that data to the table, you might miss that. And just related to that, screening, we need to th think differently about screening. And we're learning from one of our partners who's in a project with the Center for School Mental Health, who will be uh, presenting at our Chicago Forum with us next week on critical conversations related to screening. In Methune uh, Public Schools, they did a pilot, and the data is up here from John, but basically what they did is they screened all ninth graders for both anxiety and depression, because it's a pilot, and the numbers that they got justified and validated that they needed to do it. Now, there's a lot that goes on with screening. I can't get into all that right now in terms of you have to have a response system, you have to have enough trained people, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at the percentage of kids who scored in the moderate or in need of intervention range with anxiety and depression, it forces us to rethink. Uh, screeners we used to only use at tier two, such as for depression or anxiety or trauma, Maybe there's places we need to drop them down to tier one. And so the, the changes are important. So let's go back to the NPR story conclusion for a moment. So in schools, mental health should be everyone's job. What, I, what I'm trying to propose here that we're learning from our partners around the country who work with us through the interconnected system framework is there isn't one perfect way to do this. But what we know that we need to do is we need to make sure it works for teachers, it works for kids, and it works for families. And we really need to make evidence-based mental health interventions much more transparent for everybody. I know I've over-focused on the teachers, but it's the same with the kids and the families, right? We need to use different language, look at different data, and we need to connect our interventions to things that make sense 
down at the classroom level, such as respect, responsibility, safety. So if we're doing uh, an intervention for a kid who's experienced severe trauma and it's a tier three intervention, that's not something only a clinician does. But if we don't have the system structures in place to link it back down to the core curriculum in the classroom, it will remain elusive, it will remain confusing, and people will think we just need to hand off kids to other people. And let's face it, one in five kids, that, that's a pretty big number. And you know, those numbers have been around for a while, but they're now getting much more mainstream press. And I'm really excited to be part of a group with the PBIS Center and the National Center for School Mental Health who understands that the system structures we have in place for reading and social behavior actually give us the, the solid foundation we need. So whether we're talking about teams being more explicit about the choices we make for interventions. Again, no more handoff and expect one lonely clinician to have all the answers. Uh, we don't want to have partnerships with mental health centers that come in and say, we're all trained in blah, blah, so give us kids and we'll do blah, blah. Now, what we want and what we ask our partners to do is come sit on the teams with us. Look at our data, like the clinicians did in the coping cat example. The clinicians from the community, by the way, were the ones who put the word anxiety on the table, right? Because that's something, you know, if you're a mental health clinician, you throw around words like anxiety more readily than other people, right? And they're talking about these kids are going to the nurse, they're, they're you know, they're doing okay academically, you know, they weren't special ed kids. So as the school team struggles with the data, having other people there to be part of the dialogue and making that systemic, not just they show up once a month to see kids and then we ask them a question in the hallway. But if we want all the adults to feel competent, if we want all the adults to feel confident, we've got to build it right into the systems. Now we have a lot of resources and tools, and if you're going to, splitting up with your teams and going to other sessions, in the PowerPoint that'll be posted with the breakout session, there is information on website, uh, webinars, and other tools, but basically if you go to pbis.org and type in ISF, we have set up a page there. We have monthly webinars during the school year with We've had, we have a range of about 18 different states and 40 different school districts right now who are participating, but they're all recorded and anybody can go to them. So we just did one on trauma last Friday and it's posted. And we did an overview about some of the stuff I shared with you. I did the upfront and then we had a person from a local school district share what their school district's doing with regards to their mental health partnerships and trauma. I remember that one from last week because it was just last week and I did part of it. But there's a range of webinars on there and there's a range of tools. Uh, we, we tend to be over tool people, right? And so we're trying to be real careful. We have a tool chart to say when you might want to use this one versus this one, depending if you're working at the district level and you have these issues. So if you're going to jump into the learning mode with us, we welcome you. California, we're proud to say, has its own ISF webinars because you're just huge, you guys. This is a really big state, right? And mental health is a huge priority in schools in California, and you need to be proud of that. And so we, through Mike, Mike Lombardo is coordinating it with us, but there were so many issues about funding and things in California that we decided it made more sense to have a separate California ISF, we call it a targeted work group. And so I don't think we're, are we recording those, Mike, the California, we are recording the California ones, I can't even keep track. So this is not a finished product, this is not finished business, this is not just do this and it'll get better. It's a structure, it's a process, but we want you to use your teams and your tiers and a broader stakeholder group and jump in and join 
a group that's being part of the solution to our silent epidemic. So I'm going to end there.